Welcome everyone to our historic inaugural Masterminds in Nursing. I am so glad that you could join us this evening. We have three fantastic short talks for all of you this evening by three of our phenomenal nursing faculty. Before we begin, I just want to let you all know, we are so proud of all of you as our fantastic alums. We are living in an unprecedented time during this pandemic. Our thoughts and our prayers have been with all of you. My heart especially goes out to all of you who have been directly impacted in some way, shape, or form by COVID-19. I couldn't be more proud of our college, our faculty, our staff, our students, and our alums. Many who have worked on the front lines of COVID and all of our folks who have offered their support, their kindness, their caring, during this time to other people. Our college, despite this pandemic, continues to thrive on so many fronts. Our US News and World Report rankings list our programs in the top five, in the top 10, in certain circumstances, the number one program in the country. Just in the past two weeks, we have had six grants fund from the National Institutes of Health, which is phenomenal. We have come so far, but we have so much yet to do. It is never more necessary to fulfill our mission. We need to continue to dream, discover, and deliver innovative solutions to improve healthcare and the health of the people of our community, our state, our nation, and our world. As one recent example, because of our renowned reputation in wellness, Trusted Health out of California reached out to us to say, we would like you to bring wellness support to our nurses in the front lines of New York City and Detroit. Alice Till, who I will be introducing shortly, has worked furiously with me to create a fabulous wellness support partner program for nurses on the front lines. Our nurse practitioner students will be working with these nurses for four to eight weeks to help them achieve optimal health and well-being while they're caring for COVID patients. So tonight, you're going to hear from these three just fantastic faculty. You will hear so many terrific insights from them. Now, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Alice T. 
Portillo. Alice is Director of Graduate Health and Wellness Academic Programming, Director of the Innovative Telehealth Services, and an Assistant Professor of Clinical Nursing. She is a member of Ohio State's Academy of Teaching, which is a real honor, and is a fellow of the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners. Her clinical expertise in primary care includes addressing population health and well-being using telehealth technologies and improving access to care through statewide quality improvement initiatives. For her work in online nursing education, Dr. Teal was honored with the esteemed Ohio State's Provost Award for distinguished teaching. When our students come to our college, we pledge to give them the expertise that they need to thrive in healthcare and to improve outcomes. But when it comes to the future of healthcare, Alice wonders, is expertise all that we need. This is the face of a nurse. Recognized as heroes during the COVID-19 pandemic, nurses are clinical experts. Their care includes noticing problems and finding solutions. I'm proud to say that I'm a nurse and I've worked really hard to become a clinical expert I began my career 35 years ago as a diploma nurse. I have earned my bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. I've been a nurse educator for more than 25 years, a nurse practitioner for more than 20. I hold national certifications. I belong to more than a dozen professional organizations. I have a very long resume. I even share my clinical expertise by telehealth. My four brothers would tell you that they're not surprised that I made a career out of telling people what to do. You have met people like me. I've met people, clinical experts like me. One of them, my OBGYN at an annual visit, advised me that I needed to lose weight. As if I never thought of that. And I didn't say that, I did ask her how and she proceeded to explain to me that I needed to decrease my caloric intake, decrease my carbohydrates, avoid saturated fats, decrease my intake of processed foods. And as she spoke to me for more than 10 minutes about how to set up my pantry for success, I saw myself giving people education, being the clinical expert and missing a few important details. Uh, she didn't ask me about my goals. I skip breakfast. I know I shouldn't do that. She didn't assess my barriers to change. I don't actually do the grocery shopping. And she didn't discover my strengths. I have increased my physical activity and recently dropped my total cholesterol by 100 points. Now, on her behalf, Effectively coaching someone to be well is not easy, but it is so important. Six out of 10 adults have a chronic disease. One in four actually have two or more. And as nurses, we are positioned to address this because of our relationships with patients. As clinical experts, we know that health behavior can prevent chronic disease. In fact, 80% of chronic disease can be prevented. Five key behaviors prevent heart disease, cancer, diabetes, stroke. And if we have a chronic disease, 
It'll help us to avoid negative consequences. These are exercise, 30 minutes daily, eat five fruits and vegetables each day, avoid nicotine, drink alcohol in moderation, if at all, and for adults, sleep seven to nine hours each night. These probably aren't surprising to you, but less than 7% of people engage in all five. So as a nurse, I want people to be healthy. I want them to engage in these behaviors. I want them to be well. This might mean asking or inspiring them to change habits. But have you ever tried to get someone to change? We know what doesn't work. Pushing or forcing or guilting someone into changing doesn't work. It doesn't result in sustained behavior change. Telling, telling people what to do, why to do it, how to do it, that doesn't work. And we have to move away from telling. So I went on an adventure a few years ago to find out how to effectively partner with people to inspire behavior change. I enrolled in a coaching program and it involved me staying one week at a beautiful retreat center in the Pacific Northwest. Now my wellness experience there was very West Coast. It involved paleo granola, Tibetan singing bowls, drum circles, silence for 30 minutes at the beginning of each day, and even walking a labyrinth. This is the picture of the actual labyrinth that I walked in absolute silence for more than an hour. And through all of this quiet reflection and self-care and wellness activities, I did begin to recognize that allowing people to see their own goals or to set their own goals, believing that they could change, supporting them by noticing their strengths, these things mattered. My expert nursing role was not to give education, but to coach. And as I left this adventure, I wasn't sure how this information would impact me as a clinician or as an educator. I arrived at the busy airport and opened my email. And one of the many that I received was a very long email from a student detailing numerous concerns and problems. Um, and I typically would spend a good deal of time creating solutions when I receive an email like that. But instead, I simply replied that the student understood the problems and the issues very well. And I asked her what would be the next step toward creating solutions. I then closed my email, turned off my phone, boarded the plane and flew home. And when I landed, the first email I read was from a teaching colleague who said, I don't know what they did to you out there on the West Coast, but I'd like some of what you have now. Before learning coaching strategies, I would have been the expert in solving problems. Now as the coach, I recognize the student could develop the solutions. And not always being the expert is actually very freeing. There's less expectation for me to always have the answer and less expectation for me to always be right. Coaching involves listening more than talking, listening to hear goals and strengths and barriers and solutions, and then actively engaging students in their learning, actively engaging patients in their wellness. Coaching wellness, instead of telling people what to do and when to do it, means that I can be more connected, more present with people, the research, the evidence, my personal experience has shown me that this works. As a nurse, I have the opportunity and the privilege to meet people where they are. 
This approach has changed my focus from being the expert who creates the solutions to being the nurse coach who partners, listens, appreciates, and helps to support next steps. The future of healthcare requires a different approach. For people, students, patients, families, communities, populations to be well, to be healthy, to avoid chronic disease requires a different approach. A coaching approach is needed. To prevent chronic disease, it is time to focus on wellness coaching strategies, listening, appreciating, and connecting. I'm inviting you to join me in creating partnerships. Thank you. Alice, thank you for that fantastic talk. It's unfortunate, but we continue to live in a very sick care healthcare system. We will always need good, sick, acute, and critical care. But in order to prevent all of the chronic disease we have, I think you can all see why a paradigm shift to wellness in the ways that Ellis talked about is so critical. We are differentiated in our college with our live well framework. We are emphasizing so many of the elements that Ellis discussed and teaching those to our students so they can be most effective. So thank you, Ellis. And now we are going to hear from Dr. Molly McNett. We were so blessed to recently recruit Molly to our College of Nursing as a professor of clinical nursing. Molly is also assistant director of the Implementation Science Corps of our Helene Full National Trust Institute for Evidence-Based Practice. Dr. McNett's research centers on care of critically ill patients after severe neurological injury. She is widely published in peer-reviewed journals, has authored over 20 evidence-based clinical practice guidelines, and presents nationally and internationally on research and evidence-based care for patients after devastating neurological injuries. Molly also leads international interdisciplinary guideline development groups. She is certified in neuroscience nursing. She's also an esteemed fellow of the Neurocritical Care Society and the American Academy of Nursing. We teach our students the most current and up-to-date evidence-based practices. But where do these practices come from? And why do they change over time? Molly will share with us the critical importance of evidence-based guidelines and how and when we all must evolve our approach. I think we can all agree we're experiencing unprecedented times right now. The emergence of this pandemic has changed everything for us. It's changed certainly our day-to-day -day routines, it's changed how we communicate with one another, and it certainly has changed how we deliver healthcare. 
So inherent in this change has certainly been a focus on the evidence. We see news reports coming out daily and hourly with the latest data on transmission rates, progress towards cure, numbers of testing, numbers of hospitalizations. But as a nurse scientist and an expert in evidence-based practice, I don't rely on the news reports or anecdotal reports. Rather, I wake daily and I actually search for scientific reports based on evidence and the latest data that's been published to help inform what we know about this disease. And I know that I'm not alone. There are healthcare teams around the world who are doing the same and searching for evidence every day before they go in and take care of these patients. They're using that evidence to inform the care that they're providing to patients. They're using the evidence to inform and guide their discussions with patients about the latest evidence on treatments, prognosis, and also with family members about what to expect as the patient continues to recover. And I can't help but think, I'm also a nurse scientist with a focus on patients who have really severe brain injuries and are in the ICU. It's a field called neurocritical care. I can't help but wonder why are we not having the same evidence-informed discussions and how having the evidence guide our treatment for patients with other types of disease processes. For example, stroke. Stroke has remained one of the top five causes of death in the United States for decades. It remains the number one cause of lifelong disability, and it affects actually up to 95% of the world's population. So whether you've experienced a stroke yourself or you have a family member who has, or you've provided care for a patient either in the hospital or the acute care stages of healthcare, or even after the stroke when they're at home and working to get back to some sense of normalcy in their day-to-day -day lives and improve their functional outcome, we've all been impacted by stroke. And this has gone on for years. It's not a temporary crisis that will pass. There's no vaccine for stroke. It continues to be a pervasive problem. And so why aren't we searching for the evidence about stroke? And why aren't we using that evidence to inform the treatment that we provide to patients and to guide the conversations that we have with patients and their family members when this disease process affects millions of people every single year? Well, we know that the evidence for stroke is there. There are several evidence-based clinical practice guidelines that have actually synthesized the best research evidence that we have to date and put forth recommendations. So we know the research has been done, we know the evidence is there, we know that they've been synthesized into clinical practice recommendations to help healthcare teams deliver evidence-based care. But yet they're still not being followed with all patients all the time. Well, we know certainly the intent is there, Back in 2009, which was called the Institute of Medicine at the time, actually put forth recommendations that by the year 2020, 90% of all healthcare decisions would be based on best evidence. So it's now 2020, and of course that begs the question, how are we doing? Well, unfortunately, not so good. It's hard to get accurate data on the number of times or the percentage of times that care delivered in hospitals and healthcare settings is based on best evidence. But the reports that we have to date show that less than 50% of healthcare is actually based on the best evidence that's available. So again, it begs the question, why is that? If we know the evidence is there and we know we should be doing it, why are we still not doing it? And is it because perhaps healthcare clinicians and healthcare teams don't trust the evidence? Well, I work with guideline development teams around the world in developing clinical practice guidelines. And these teams follow a rigorous methodology and a structured process that has been put forth again by the Institute of Medicine several years ago to actually develop clinical practice guidelines that we can trust. So there's a structured process that guideline development groups have to use when they're generating these evidence-based recommendations for care. The focus on this development is a transparent process where every step of the process is documented with lots of moving pieces and parts, but it's followed synchronously every single time with the guideline development groups that we work with. It involves use of expert librarians to critically search the evidence and ensure that we include anything that's relevant to the topic that we're investigating. It includes a synthesis and a critique of the available ev evidence to actually generate clinical practice recommendations. There's an expert methodologist who guides the guideline development panel, and that panel is made up of clinical teams and experts from around the world who are volunteering their time to put forth these recommendations to guide practice. And all of this process takes about a year, and it takes up to sometimes another year for the peer review process to take place of the evidence that was synthesized and generated for these clinical practice recommendations. 
There's multiple rounds of peer review that, that happen, both internal peer review by the society that's putting forth the guideline, but also external peer review from other clinicians in the field, posting for public commentary and feedback from patients and families. And this is all before the evidence-based clinical practice guidelines even get published in a peer review journal. So it's certainly a systematic and rigorous process that's followed. So again, it begs the question, if the evidence is there, and we know that there's a structured, trustworthy process to generate clinical practice recommendations, why are they still not consistently being followed by healthcare teams for every disease process every time? Well, because change is hard, and I think we can all agree that change is hard. Integrating these evidence-based recommendations into practice is hard. It requires organizational change. Oftentimes it requires culture change, changes to policies and procedures and order sets, additional education for experts and healthcare teams throughout the whole health system or whatever the practice setting may be. But the good news is there's a field called implementation science that I work within that generates evidence on the most effective strategies that healthcare teams can use when integrating evidence into practice. And I work with an amazing team at the Helene Fold Health Trust National Institute for Evidence-Based Practice in Nursing and Healthcare. It's housed here within the College of Nursing at The Ohio State University. And the Fold provides training and education and tools and resources to healthcare teams around the world on how to best synthesize the evidence that is there and integrate it into their practice. We use strategies from the field of implementation science to guide these teams on the best ways to integrate that evidence into the care that they provide. We can no longer settle for the way that things have always been done. Rather, we are working to transform the future of healthcare to ensure that evidence-informed care is used with all patients and all disease processes all the time. Molly, thank you for that fantastic talk, but more importantly, for all the wonderful work that you do. And I want everybody to know that our full National Institute for Evidence-Based Practice has been working tirelessly with hospitals, healthcare systems, all throughout the United States and globe to improve the quality and safety of care through evidence-based practice. Most recently, our Fold Institute live streamed our wonderful five-day evidence-based practice immersion workshop to 18 VAs across the United States. We truly are creating a brighter future for health in America and throughout the globe. Our third and final presentation tonight will be given by Dr. Shannon Gillespie. And I have to tell you a personal story about Shannon. When she was a second year PhD student, she came into my office and we talked about her dream of really improving maternal infant health and how much she wanted to stay on, on our wonderful faculty when she completed her PhD. I always ask our faculty, staff, and students, what will you do in the next five to 10 years if you know you cannot fail? Many people have a hard time expressing those dreams. Shannon had no issue with that. So Shannon works to really optimize the health and well being of moms, pregnant women, and their infants. She is part of our newly endowed Martha S. Pitzer Center for Women, Children, and Youth, named after one of our beloved nursing faculty. 
Shannon's Laboratory. And by the way, she is founding principal investigator of the Maternal Immune Monitoring Laboratory. She works to optimize maternal infant health by developing immune-based precision health approaches to prevent complications of pregnancy and postpartum, including through clinical screening tool development. Over the past 17 years, Dr. Gillespie has advanced from an undergraduate research assistant to a graduate research associate, individual fellow, and career development awardee from the National Institutes of Health. She has a strong and building record of external funding, publication, and leadership. Her work has been recognized through awards such as the Midwestern Nursing Research Society's Women's Health and Childbearing Research Interest Group Graduate Research Publication and New Investigator Awards. Her work is fueled by her family's personal experiences with health and wellness, and she hopes to achieve her long-term goals by bringing together a team of individuals from diverse disciplines with a shared dream and vision of optimal health for every mom and every baby. I want to remind all of you to please submit your questions through the question and answer function because all three of these fabulous faculty will be joining us for a question and answer session after Shannon's talk. Shannon is on a personal and professional mission to create better outcomes for mothers during the uncertain time of pregnancy. She will now share with us how we can search for direction in times of uncertainty. More than 15 years ago, I found nursing during a very difficult time in my own life. And I think I was really looking for a silver lining or a glimmer of hope. Now for me, I was 20 years old and my mom, my best friend, was diagnosed with advanced cancer. And that was the start of a five year journey for my family marked by misdiagnoses, failed treatments, and then ultimately the loss of someone that we loved very much. And this all came despite the best efforts of her care team with the best tools that they had available at that time. What I remember most about this experience was this distinct, constant feeling of uncertainty, just truly not knowing what would happen next. And I think that was the hardest part for us. What I also remember and what truly changed my life was the nurses. Now these were individuals I was perhaps sitting down with for the first time that would hold my hand, help us through difficult news and formulate a plan to move forward. I truly started to see these nurses as my heroes and I wanted to be just like them when I grew up, right? So soon after I entered nursing school. Now during nursing school, I fell in love with the care of moms and babies. And this is something I hear from students often, uh, but something about that care during new life is truly magical, being a part of that. I think for me, subconsciously, I was probably also moving a little bit away from that end of life that had become so real for my family for so long. But unfortunately, it did not take long for me to understand that 
uncertainty and even some devastating situations are also present at the beginning of life as well. So in particular, in what has really become the focus of my program of research, I began to note and witness these preterm births. So this is the early birth of a baby simply before they are ready to enter this world. This is common in the United States. Uh, it's about one in 10 births and also worldwide. So when we think about the fact that there are 141 million births across the world, this number adds up quickly. Now, oftentimes we do not know or understand what precedes or causes that preterm birth. So it's very difficult to prevent something that you can't predict or understand. Now, when I think of pregnancy, I really think of this journey, this experience, and we don't often talk about death in this context, right? So we know across the world there are about 56 million deaths every year. 5.4 million of those deaths are to children under the age of five. This number falls after age ranges only of 75 to 79 and 80 to 84. So when you think about that high peak followed by a gap and another high peak, there is something really wrong about these early deaths, right? It does not fall into that concept of life expectancy. And it's something that I've always really aimed to address. So we know that most of these deaths are occurring in the first month of life. And the number one cause is preterm birth. And this is something that, that we can't ignore, that we have to keep pursuing a solution to. So I can think back to my first job uh, in phone triage in an OBGYN clinic and women calling in with perhaps experiencing some cramping or contractions during pregnancy. Now, oftentimes that will go away. We can do a couple of things and it, it will be relieved, but sometimes it will progress. Sometimes it will go away and return. And it's very hard to identify who those true risk cases are versus just normal variations in pregnancy. So there is so much uncertainty in that process and so much relying on what you're experiencing to know how to watch and address it. What we also know is that once we hit that point of true labor, it is very difficult to stop. So what we're aiming for is prevention, but we simply don't have those tools yet. So if you think about your journey of pregnancy and you're sitting there at the beginning looking ahead, it is truly beautiful, right? You look out, you envision the future. It's fairly predictable. We know about how long that journey should be. And you can start to vision very realistically what you might encounter in your future. So for me and my family, that might be the preference of cuddles to sleep during long nights. Uh, that might be enjoying a family meal where you're wearing more of it than you're eating because the baby is having so much fun playing. Those are very real feelings and emotions for families as they're, as they're building their group together. And this is something that can be very devastating if you don't get to realize that. So we also recognize that there can be these challenges or rapids, right, to a pregnancy. We we know that women will encounter something, right, be it an infection, a stressor in her life. But what we have a harder time understanding is how the body will respond to that in a way that can versus cannot maintain the pregnancy. So right now it's very difficult for us to be able to prescribe or think about the best path for women to overcome those challenges. And that's really something that my laboratory is trying to address. So in 2017, I launched the Maternal Immune Monitoring Laboratory and work with a tremendous group of individuals every day uh, trying to uh, reach our goals uh, within what we're aiming to do. And we look at a very specific challenge during pregnancy and that's an immune challenge. So we know that these immune cells will typically fight germs in our body, right? So bacteria, viruses, even different proteins that we release when there's damage or something like that. But we also know that immune cells seem to be repurposed during pregnancy in very interesting and specific ways. Now at the time of labor, including term labor, you see these immune cells rush to the maternal fetal interface and they'll help mom through that process. In fact, it's very hard to stop that from happening once it is. What we don't quite understand is that these immune cells are perhaps 
driving labor early on and a lot of signs indicate that they may be. So we'll see oftentimes infection or even inflammation in the absence of infection in cases of preterm birth. And what we're trying to do is move beyond this measurement of infectious exposures or inflammatory markers passively in mom's blood because those don't seem to predict or prevent preterm birth. We're looking at this critical piece of the maternal immune response to challenges that they may encounter. So what I'm really envisioning is this simple blood test that we could give to every mom across the world to help us for the first time confidently understand and communicate immune associated risk for that pregnancy. Once we have those predictive models, we can begin to prevent instead of treat later on that point of no return, what we think might be happening. So what we really aim for is looking for those earliest biological deviations before a single challenge has been encountered. We try to predict that for you so that, that we can then provide these testing guidelines to help us move through that. Now, I want to move beyond that initial recognition early on in nursing school of lives lost to lives saved, right? This is really our goal, why we come into work every day. One life, better yet, many lives. But what we're aiming to do is provide this glimpse into future events so that we can change the way that pregnancy or really many disease processes could be experienced. Removing important layers of uncertainty so that we confidently understand what's happening and how we can proceed for that individual. I'm already looking forward to that moment in time where a nurse may hold your hand or your family member's hand and can tell you that everything will be okay because we know what's wrong and we know how to fix it. That would be a tremendous feeling for everybody. Now that's the future of health that I envision for moms and babies. I hope that you'll join me in pursuing that vision, but also bringing this to every aspect of healthcare and immune related health and otherwise. Thank you, Shannon, for that awesome talk. We have to remember childhood is the foundation for the rest of adult life. So this type of cutting edge research that Shannon is doing is so critical. I'm now going to bring all of our fantastic faculty back for our question and answer session of this masterminds feature. Molly, I'm going to address the first question that has come in to you. The question is this, we have seen almost too much evidence come out so quickly during the COVID-19 pandemic. How do you discern what evidence is good evidence? Well, that's a great question and one that we encounter often with many of the teams that we work with and many colleagues in the field. I think one of the most important things is for nurses and all members of the healthcare team to have a basic understanding of a, what a level of evidence is. Um, so certainly we teach this at the fold and we learn this in nursing school, but if you need a quick refresher, you know, think about the pyramid of the levels of evidence and it is available, you know, certainly online for people. If you need a quick refresher, if it's been a while since you've looked at that information, but that's really the critical piece. And, you know, the, the pyramid indicates you know, the highest level of evidence is certainly a systematic review and randomized controlled trials, and it kind of goes on down the, py the pyramid in terms of the strength of the evidence uh, with expert opinion and case reports really towards the bottom of that. And what we're seeing is a lot of case reports, which are certainly important and are cer certainly informing some of the care that that we're delivering to patients, but it's important to recognize that that's one of the lower tiers of evidence um, and for people to recognize that and not necessarily use it to dictate the, the practice uh, and the treatment decisions that they're having, but rather to use it uh, as a guide, as anecdotal evidence, which essentially is what it is. So I think that's uh, one of the first things. I think the second thing too is to look at the publication source is always important. Um, that's not always a, a kind of a, a solid rule, but for the most part in the more reputable journals, um, there is still a peer review process. So if you can validate if the article has gone through a peer review process, that's really a critical piece to also uh, de determining you know, the strength of that evidence and the quality of that evidence. 
Um, many of the, the journals that are very widely viewed and highly respected, even in the midst of this pandemic, are able to do very rapid peer review. Um, I'm on several of the editorial boards and a reviewer for many of these. And we actually have little micro teams of reviewers who are able to turn around a peer review in about 48 hours. Um, and so that is being done by a lot of the reputable journals in order to kind of speed publication. Um, but I'd be leery of those journals that don't have any peer review process. Um, and that journals that you're not familiar with, um, or if they have a very, very rapid within a day um, from submission to publication date, that might indicate to you that a peer review process has not taken place. So I would, I would encourage people to really look beyond just the title of the article and don't read just the abstract, really look at the, the text uh, within that, identify the level of evidence, identify the source as well. Great, thank you, Molly. So there is this really great question. There's actually a couple of questions related to wellness, particularly for nurses during the COVID pandemic. This one question says, can you elaborate on how or what recommendations you have for nurse leaders in leveraging self-care during the pandemic. Um, part of my role here at the university, as you all know, is chief wellness officer. And I'm charged with spearheading health and well-being for faculty, staff, clinicians, students across the university. We have a lot of healthcare system problems that need fixed. So nurses can do better self-care. Even before the pandemic, we were seeing 50% of nurses, physicians, and other healthcare providers reporting burnout, depression, and the suicide rate even going up. It takes a multi-component approach like we have put into place here at Ohio State. I could actually spend three hours <laughs> answering this particular question, but I won't do that tonight. I want to emphasize so often nurses feel guilty when they prioritize their own self-care. We've got to provide them with wellness cultures, wellness support systems that make these behaviors the norm, not something that's aberrant. We are doing this for our students. And I'd like, Alice, I'd love you to talk about some of the things we are integrating in our graduate program to really teach our students how to do good self-care so they don't burn out once they get into the field. Mm -hmm. I think um, I, I totally agree with you, Vaughn. I think that there's a lot about culture that makes a huge difference. And so when students learn how to partner with others in their wellness, they actually value, they recognize how valuable wellness is and they start to take care of themselves better as well. Um, one of the things that I think has really um, made a big difference are partnerships. So there was a question even in the question and answer about um, somebody sharing about when they were working as a nurse, how isolated they felt. And so one of the strategies is creating a partnership. So when students learn these coaching techniques, they actually are assigned another student and they, they set wellness goals and they talk about where they are with those goals. They meet four to six times during the beginning of the semester and they check in with each other. So formalizing that in that way, people feel less isolated. They know they're going to talk to their wellness partner. So once students get used to doing that and talking about wellness and checking in and becoming an accountability partner, it's easier for them to do that with other students. And so this summer, especially because of COVID and because of the anxiety, 
all 260 plus graduate students are creating wellness partnerships. They're partners with each other and they are also becoming wellness partners with other students in other health sciences colleges. And then they're becoming, they're working on wellness with nurses across the country. Um, so it's been this gradual change that we've seen as part of our culture, um, meaning that we value it, we as faculty connect with each other. And so students learn that if they have what we call a buddy, that it's easier to have the conversation. It's already set up. And that's made a big difference. Thank you, Alex. Shannon, here's a question that's come in for you. Have you noted any correlation with psychosocial stressors in pregnancy and immune markers? Yes, absolutely. Um, Thank you for asking that question because I, I didn't really talk about it, but um, I actually got into the science that I'm doing initially after a degree in psychology. Um, so I went through the graduate entry program at the College of Nursing. Um, and as I fell in love with that work with mom, moms and babies and preterm birth, one of the first things I noticed uh, based on my background was the associations between preterm birth and stress. Um, so we can think of stress in a few ways. Those are um, exposures to stressors, um, also our reaction to that. So our um, embodiment of those stressors and then the biology of those stressors. Um, and my dissertation was focused on um, psychosocial stress and uh, immune mediated markers in preterm birth. Um, and my findings from that is actually what sent me along this pathway of thinking of these markers, um, not only in terms of pathways and mechanisms, but our ability to use these in the clinical care of patients. Um, so preterm birth comes in, in several forms and that's why it's so difficult to study is that there are very distinct different phenotypes. So people can arrive at this from very, very different pathways. One of the major pathways is stress associated. And we had often thought that the HPA axis, so this production of cortisol um, under periods of stress was a, a major accelerator of the placental clock, we called it once we were making a a lot of cortisol by the end of pregnancy, accelerated patterns of that due to stress could increase timing of birth. We're starting to understand that stress effects on the immune system related to glucocorticoid um, anti-inflammatory actions and otherwise also seem to play a very major role. Uh, so thank you for that question. It's, it's a um, focus of my research uh, in every study that I do. Thank you, Shannon. There are more questions coming in about wellness. I want to share that I just was part of a panel for an hour online presentation from the American Nurses Association on that specific topic. I will make sure we send all of you the link to that webinar, it is free. And it has a lot of fabulous uh, tactics, short evidence-based tactics that can be used for wellness, especially for nurses on the front lines. Shannon, there's another follow-up question. Um, and I think you addressed it a little bit when you talked about anxiety stress. But the question is, are we seeing increased premature levels due to the prematurity, due to the anxiety related to this pandemic? That's a great question. So. Um one thing we have noted is that in very preliminary studies, and, and um, as Molly was discussing, we're looking for those systematic reviews now instead of the case studies, so trying to compile that data uh, in a way that we can think of it scientifically. Um, but there, there is potential that we're seeing a little bit earlier births than what we're used to, um, and we're still sorting that data out. Um, mechanisms is a great question. Um, one thing that we're looking at, of course, is, is critical illness of 
the mother, um, but also knowing that um, stress specific to pregnancy, so worrying about the health of the pregnancy, anxiety and depression have been linked to preterm birth in the past. That's certainly um, something that we'll keep an eye on. Um, something in particular that seems to be popping up is um, premature rupture of the membranes, in some cases a little bit more, more frequently than we would see too. So we might actually focus in on some of these specific pathways to preterm birth through biological markers and, and mechanisms um, using, using those biomarker studies. But it's still unfolding on a, on a daily basis and, and we're keeping a really close eye. The, the more that we can see in terms of data, the better we'll understand it, but there's a lot of work ahead. Thank you, Shannon. Molly, a question for you. How do you view the nursing profession's role in meeting the 90% benchmark for using evidence-based practice to support clinical decisions in our practice? Well, I don't think it's going to be any surprise. It is integral. <laughs> it is central. If you think about the nurse and how we function in healthcare teams at the bedside, nurses are the ones who really coordinate all the teams and the, and the delivery of the care. We're central in that model. We always have been and we always will be. And we need to capitalize on that. We really should be the ones at the center of, of this team uh, integrating, getting people out of the silos because we, again, we function in teams. So we should be integrating evidence-based practice in teams and nurses should be an integral part of that team. And in many cases, able to lead those teams. So the training that we provide at the Fold Institute through the immersions uh, really focuses on training nurses, but also interdisciplinary teams. Most of our participants are nurse, nursing groups, but we do often have interdisciplinary members attend as well. And we teach nurses all the steps of EBP. So how to critically appraise the evidence, how to synthesize the evidence, how to generate uh, you know, some basic indicators of, of what the best evidence tells us we should be doing. And then we have a science-based approach with implementation science about how you actually do it. I mean, that's usually the, the hardest part. Most people um, you know, have some type of access or awareness of what the, what the evidence may be, um, but then just aren't sure about how to implement it. And nurses we really see as integral members of that team to actually uh, implement it into practice. So certainly nurses are, are at the, the forefront of that and I think are integral to any team approach to evidence-based practice. And I think um, the, the DNPs as well are, are really in a prime position to be leaders of those teams with the training that they're getting, uh, especially through the program here at OSU and really being, being able to be a, a very vocal uh, presence as a leader for these teams. So I think it's absolutely critical that, that nurses are really the center of these teams. Thank you, Molly. So there is a philosophy we have in our college, and that is in God we trust, but everybody else better bring data to the table. And we really, our college is so great and not only generating this fabulous evidence by our researchers, but then helping people to translate it more rapidly than 17, 20, or 25 years in the practice. We really have to break that paradigm and switch it. We are now at the end of our time. There are more questions. We will be happy to reach out to you personally. There's more wellness questions. I really want to direct all of you to the COVID-19 resource site that we created out of my chief wellness office. And that, if you just go to OST or wellness.osu.edu, you will get to all the fabulous topics we have available. I wanted to just give you an update because I'm also getting questions about our new building. Uh, we have dreamed. We have worked so hard for this new building addition that we designed. We were only about three weeks from groundbreaking when the pandemic hit. 
it is temporarily paused right now. But $7 million of that funding has got to come from the state. And because of state budget cuts, we remain hopeful. But even though those dollars were approved by the state, we're not sure when we are going to receive them. And I really want to thank those of you who are in tune tonight, who have contributed to the building campaign that we are in. We so appreciate your support. We are going to keep dreaming, discovering, and delivering a healthier world. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Stay well. And last but not least, go Bucks! <laughs>